getting started here this morning. Good morning, church. Welcome to Pathways. Welcome online if you're watching from your home. We appreciate you joining in with us today, and thank you all for coming, um, attending in person. It's so nice to see people. <laughs> so why don't we stand this morning? There's a scripture that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. There's, there's a place we can go where there's joy and there's refreshment and there's fulfillment. And another psalm says that one thing that I ask that I would seek is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And I kind of touched on the word dwell last, last week a bit. But that's just abiding in his presence 24-7 all the time. And in his presence is joy. Lots of joy. So we're going to sing 10,000 Reasons to Bless the Lord. So join us from your homes. Join us from your seat out there. We worship today. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. 
Amen. You may be seated. Welcome, church. Good morning. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. It's good to come together and to worship the Lord and to give him our thanks for all of his many blessings. We are, of course, focusing our sermon series on Thanksgiving throughout the month of November, and we are continuing uh, that this morning uh, with a look into Habakkuk, and uh, Chaplain Light will be delivering that uh, message to us here in a moment. Uh, as we uh, prepare to take up our offering, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of announcements. Uh, I'm holding a Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Christmas Box. Uh, we have some of those out in the foyer. If you have not picked up one or two, or as many as you will fill and bring back, um, please do so. Uh, we also this year, for those of you who are joining us online, there is an online option for you to participate. Simply get on the uh, Operation Christmas Child website and there are uh, options for you to fill the box virtually this year. But for those of you who still like to uh, kind of get that hands-on uh, experience of getting out there and, and just knowing that you're selecting something for a special uh, young child uh, that is in great need, and you just want to uh, know that, yeah, I've selected something I hope is going to really light up their, their, their life. Uh, and it is going to be delivered with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you would like to uh, do that, I encourage you to get it. We need them back next Sunday. Okay, it's already that quick. So next Sunday is the 22nd of November. That's when we're going to be taking up all of our boxes. It is also when we will be taking up a designated offering for Samaritan's Purse. So I uh, encourage you all to uh, bear that in mind that next Sunday we'll be taking up a designated offering to support this great ministry to children around the world. So I encourage you to do that. And for the children within our world, uh, those who are joining us here, make sure that they all get those, these little handouts that we have been providing at the beginning of the uh, of services so that they have something to do until we get to that point when we can all have the the fun children's ministries that we so so dearly love and like to provide so um I do want to uh one last comment for those of you who are trying to figure out how do i get connected to pathway and to all the wonderful ministry opportunities that are are coming and will be coming uh in in the months ahead uh just text connect c-o-n-n-e-c-t to area code 913-270-8008 and we'll get you registered and on our line uh, for getting information as uh, it becomes available you get all of our announcements sent to you and you'll be able to uh, track what's going on from where you are so with that i ask you to join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to to give back to the Lord a portion of what he has so generously given to us. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all of your many blessings. Thank you for the great joy and privilege of knowing you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, the, just the sheer joy of the release of the weight of sin that we have experienced when we gave ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ giving to him all the, the junk in our lives to receive an abundant life, a life filled with the presence and mercies and grace of God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing and continue to do. We ask, Lord, that you would receive our offerings and you would bless and multiply them for the furtherance of your ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there was a day in history that all hope seemed lost, that everything seemed to die when Jesus was laid in the tomb and Satan thought he won, but he didn't because we serve a God of resurrection power. We serve a God who brings the dead back to life. He calls the dead to life. He breathes life into our bones. He breathes life into our circumstances and our situations so 
he res- and he restores hope. And he, um, he redeems things for his good purpose and his pleasure. So today as we continue worship, we're going to sing a new song called All Hail King Jesus. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the name above all other names. As, as you stand with us, we are going to sing about his power, his authority, and worship him this morning. There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known (laughs) For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn What a sacrifice was made At the heaven's door And we sing Oh, hail King Jesus Oh
God. Praise God. You know, Jesus never said that um, we needed faith as big as an ocean or as tall as a mountain. All he said was we needed faith as just itty bitty, itty bitty mustard seed. And that that faith, we could speak to that mountain to be moved and cast into the sea. But we don't move the mountain. God moves the mountain. He just takes our faith and uses that to get it out of the way for us. And then we stand back and we watch the mountains move and the walls fall and, and our faith grows and it matures again. And we're not, we're not um, controlled by our emotions in the situation, the process of it, because our emotions are not a barometer of our faith. Our, our feelings follow our faith. If we put our faith forward, our feelings will follow and we'll see God doing his promise again and again and again and he will do it again. Bye. 
Amen. We enter into that time in our service where we humbly submit our cares and concerns to the Lord of all creation. As the song says, he doesn't fail us. And I know we are all in that point where we're getting tired we want to see change. We want to see something new. We want to see the end of our troubles. We want to see the time when we can all come together. And yet God is saying, one more time around the walls. He may be telling you, cast out your net one more time. He may be preparing us for something marvelous. Just hold fast and know that he will not fail. Please pray with me. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before your throne. Lord, we come with diverse needs, struggles, concerns. You know them all. You know them better than we know them ourselves. As we learned last week, you care so much for us that every tear we cry is precious to you. 
you cherish them and you write them down in your book. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of the trials and the tribulations of this life, we have a joy that is unspeakable, unshakable, that comes through a relationship with Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us no matter where we are, whether in this sanctuary together or huddled up at home or in a car, you are with us. And by your spirit, your church is one. Unite our hearts to share the gospel, to share the love of Christ, to provide meal to the hungry and a drink to the thirsty. Lord, as we enter into these days that we typically celebrate family and offer to you our thanks. Lord, some are frustrated over things not being as they have been. But Lord, one thing remains the same. You love us and you bless us beyond measure. And you are rightly due our thanksgiving and our praise. Forgive us. By the might of your spirit, help us to forgive others. Prepare our hearts to receive your word through your servant Eric, Lord. I pray that you will change us Conform us into the likeness of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. Super. Excellent. Good to be here. I have been out for a bit, and it is good to be back in the pulpit. Uh, great to see all of you here. Thank you for, uh, for being here. For those of you at home, uh, I know there are a myriad of distractions. I, I mean, <laughs> the Masters is on, right? And, you know, you can find any sort of things that, you, that would occupy your time. But if you are here live listening to us, you have obviously seen that, uh, you know, there is something that you need in your life. And I really pray that today we can, we can help you because it is hard. It is really, really hard. In a day in which we are asked to be so distant from other people physically, to feel those same things that we felt for so many years, especially if we've been believers for a long time. So thank you for making the effort. And again, I hope that uh, we are we're doing the kind of things that are, that are going to help you. Um, I am not the kind of chaplain who, who recycles messages. <laughs> Right? I, I know there's, there's, there's this big wave of, of among my, my brethren out there who will just pull from something they've done years and years and years ago. And I just, I do not ever, ever do that. And, and I feel as though you need kind of a, a genuine picture of, of where the person who's speaking to you is at on the spiritual plane. That, that you would feel close and connected to them because we're just people who are struggling along like you are, right? We're, we're trying to do the best that we can as well. And this week, this message, man, this message hit me. You know, uh, when, when you come across something where you look at it and you say, you know what, you need this in your life too, that is a such, such a humbling moment. And I just want you to know that today is, as I go through this and I speak to you, and if you are hit by it the way that I am hit by it, then I think we may be hitting on the right chord here because I think this is a, a, a message that helps us to see where it is God would take all of us if we were just willing to do so. So today we're going to talk about thankfulness, but we're going to do it from the book of Habakkuk. Okay, I have a bad habit of saying that name wrong. Right? Uh, I, I grew up in a mountain church. They said it a different way. If, if, I, if I mess it up and say something different, just forgive me, okay? Uh, in, in fact, when I, if, if you'll turn over there in your Bibles, you'll find it yeah, somewhere between Daniel and like Matthew. It's like really at the 
back end of all those minor prophets in the Bible. Uh, it's only a three-chapter book, and I thought it would be really good today for us to kind of have a look at what Habakkuk has to say to us because we just looked at Isaiah not too long ago, right? And just I think three weeks ago was when we had the last sermon in Isaiah, and we spent a lot of time on it. And this is very close to the same time in which Isaiah was written, not very, not very far away. But you'll notice that there is something very, very different in the way that Habakkuk um, approaches things. The way that he says things is so different than Isaiah. So if you're there, let's go ahead and, and start reading. We're going to start in the very first chapter and <laughs> look at this opening. Okay, I'm going to start in verse 2. It says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry. But you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all of this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and I see violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice. In the courts, the wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. I would call that a really, really strong opening. Would you, would you agree with me? Um, but what you have to do here is, is start to kind of understand the circumstances that are surrounding what Habakkuk is saying and why he is saying these things. So... Let's put our history hats on for a couple of minutes. Let's kind of give ourselves some context for this book and sort of understand sort of where he is coming from because he's really, really angry with God, is he not? I mean, he's pretty, pretty upset. So this is around 600 B.C. If you remember from Isaiah, that was around 700 B.C., maybe just a little bit north of that. Remember, when you go B.C., every number that goes up is later in time, whereas, you know, we're so used to A.D. time, everything that goes down, that's, that's much, much longer ago. So Isaiah was earlier than Habakkuk. So here are the things that have happened, right? We remember from looking at Isaiah that at that time, the northern kingdom was, was in great jeopardy of, of going away because the Assyrians were there, and the Assyrians took care of business. They completely wiped them out. And by the grace of God, through one of their righteous kings, one of the only ones that they had, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, whose king was Hezekiah, was miraculously saved, right? And the Assyrians were called away, they had some issues, and eventually their kingdom fell, right? Well, it took a hundred years for them to get there. A hundred years before Assyria actually fell, and who did they fall to? They fell to the Babylonians, right? Who at the time, King Hezekiah thought, was basically their friends. And I find it very interesting that the Babylonians, man, they were kind of crazy. They, they spent all of this time getting into Nineveh, capturing Nineveh, taking over the Assyrian Empire. And if I'm a soldier in that army, I'm thinking, man, it is time to go home. <laughs> we have done this a long time. We have a tremendous battle. We are on top of the world. What else is there to do, right? They don't even go home. Where do they go? Directly to Jerusalem. Interesting. Why would you do that, right? Well, if you remember 100 years ago, what was the last thing King Hezekiah did? took the Babylonian emissaries, brought them into the castle and said, look at this great, great thing that we have here. Isn't it wonderful? And folks, Judah, the, you know, Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, they are just hanging on by a thread. They have no army. They are, they are disorganized. They have had repeatedly bad, bad, bad kings, kings that have no interest in following God. So you had this crazy kind of hybrid. There's a few priests around that still support, you know, Jehovah, and then you have all of these Asherah poles and any number of, of just idols that are just strewn around. And it's, 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 it's a community of chaos. What they're trying to do is to keep their head down as low as possible so that they'll just bypass them and go down to Egypt and take care of that, right? <laughs> just ignore us because we don't have any way of defending ourselves. Well, they don't. They come in and they just take anything that they want. Go straight to the temple, take every gold piece they can get their hands on. If they can't get their hands on it, well, they'll just take up the bolts and take that with them too. Take everything. Not only do they take the things in the temple, it's a brain drain for the entire country. 
This is when Daniel was taken up and taken over to Babylon, right? This is where all of the head officials, anybody who's young and smart, we're taking you with us. And if you're not, we're leaving you here. And when they leave you here, what, what is left, right? You are a now a subjugated people. You have a king who is only a king by name. He's just really a puppet of the entire, he does whatever they tell him to do, right? And all the things that you're now required to do is that you've been doing for years, you know, planting and, and reaping crops and making sure that you have business. Well, all of that is skimmed off the top. No one has the life that they used to have. And even that life that they used to have, it wasn't all that great. It's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. And here we find Habakkuk in the middle of this. Now, they're not completely destroyed. Not everyone has been taken away from Jerusalem and to Babylon yet. They just took the best, right? So they're just kind of a remnant that is left. And they are not having fun. People are suffering. And Habakkuk is not shy at all to walk into this and say to God, why have you done this to us? I mean, this is the very first thing that he says, is it not? Oh God, how long do I have to put up with this evil that is roaming around me? And God has a reply. If you read on farther in that chapter, and I'm going to skip over some of that because I know we've seen it in a lot of the other prophetic books, but God replies in the same way that he always replies. You ever notice that in the middle of our anxiety, the one thing that is constant, the one thing that, that doesn't change, that is, is actually beautiful in nature, is God. I mean, he's, he is a rock. He is so steady. His message is always the same. And this is what he says. Don't be dismayed. They are only here because I'm allowing it, and I need them for my purposes. Just like he needed Assyria for the purposes he had in Isaiah, he now needs the same purposes for Babylon. But Habakkuk, bless his heart, he doesn't understand that. Right? So here comes a second round in which Habakkuk has another set of questions. If you move on down to verse 12, we're going to read again for just a couple of verses. This is what it says. It says, Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you don't plan to wipe us out. See what he's concerned about? <laughs> he's concerned that, that God, even though he knows him, he's in a dangerous situation. And he's, he's, he has a foreign nation that he's just afraid of. And his concern is he would allow them to take the entire country. Lord, if you plan to wipe us out, our, oh, Lord, our rock. You have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Do you, do you hear his concern? His concern is, first of all, I, I don't want to get wiped out, right? I, I, I would like to continue living. <laughs> and the second thing is, is are you going to turn a blind eye? Even though I know you are a just judge, are you going to turn a blind eye to these savages coming here and doing this to your people? You ever have that question for yourself? I mean, like, you live a righteous life and then the bad things start to happen, right? The bad things just, just pile on. Man, sometimes they just don't ever seem to stop. And you wonder. God, why is it so easy for someone else who doesn't even care for your ways and so hard for me? It doesn't mean that God has ever changed. He is still the same. He just simply is, has a plan that you're not aware of. <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay to struggle through that. You just have to have the right answer in the end. In essence, I feel like Habakkuk is asking, why does it have to be this way? Why have you chosen to do this to us? Why these people who have such disdain for us, why are they in such control? Verse 17, I think, is the real answer to these questions. If you, if you pop down there, this is what God says. He says, uh, I'm sorry, this is Habakkuk. He says, will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever with their heartless conquest? Habakkuk goes from being really, really angry with God, right? that he would allow such evil to exist and, and allow them to, to be in charge, to, hey, are you, are you going to do the right thing here? And his question coming down to, are they going to succeed forever with their heartless conquest? And God takes chapter 2, and he gives his response. Now, when we go through things, we don't necessarily have this great opportunity to actually hear from God, to get a message from him, right? 
It happens. I'm not going to deny that it does, but it's rare. Instead, the thing that we have to do is we have to take the experiences of others, the things that God has said to them, we have to apply it to our situation because in all of this time, regardless if it's 600 B.C. or 700 B.C., in all that time, God has not changed. He's the, still the same God here in 2020 that he was back then. So when he says something, we need to pay attention to those things. And God has a message here that is so familiar. <laughs> we saw it in Isaiah. If you look in Jeremiah, you see it. If you look in Ezekiel, you see it. If you look in Psalms, you see it. You see it everywhere God has something to say because he is changeless right he is the same and here's what he says here's who he talks about right and the things that he disdains number one i don't like the proud right and then he talks about those who would take ill-gotten gain and use it for their own glory right for the things that they want he doesn't like that that hasn't changed ever he talks about thieves talks about murderers he talks about those who are corrupt those that would use drunkenness in order to kind of get things working in their direction he talks about idolaters and he doesn't like them and he says that i am a just god and i will punish in due time for all of those who choose to be these people you just have to believe me is what god is saying and then verse 20 verse 20 is the one that i think really really gets to what habakkuk needs to hear chapter 2 verse 20 says this but the lord the lord is in his holy temple let all the earth be silent before him. He is establishing the fact that regardless of what you may see day to day, regardless of what's going on outside your door or your window, nothing has changed as far as my status of being the God who created this earth and who still has the ability to judge those who live upon it. That has not changed. And I think if I were to paraphrase God, I think this is maybe, maybe what he's trying to say through these things. I see what you see, right? I, I, I see your concerns. These people that, <laughs> that you just described, their reward is coming. And it isn't something that they're going to enjoy. Judgment by God always comes. It's just we aren't given sight on when that timing is. Even today, even today, we live a pretty nice life here in America. We don't think about judgment very often. <laughs> Not at all, actually. But it is a part of what God sees. It's a part of his reality. It's a part of going to be a part of all of our realities. It's just we haven't got to the time for it to happen yet. I think God is also saying, I am still God. I am still in control. Evil, idolatrous empires always find a way to implode upon themselves because for the same reason that they were great is the same reason they fall because they abandon me. Right? Great empires have a tendency to not be destroyed by something outside. Where are they destroyed from? Inside. Right? They have huge disagreements among one another because they have no common threat. Nothing to worship together. Nothing to believe in solidly as a people. And it destroys them. But I think he's also saying, Habakkuk... <laughs> not for you you have me you have a solid rock to depend on will you do it and this one realization this this one encounter with god really is something that i think changes habakkuk's entire perspective he is he is he no longer has these questions he's like job right job had a lot of questions for god at the end of the book a lot of things happened to him that he felt was really really bad and he came to God and he says, why do you do this? And God says, were you there when I did all of these things? And what did it do to, to Job? It humbled him. Just like we see Habakkuk here, he really, really starts to humble himself. And we see a big departure in chapter 3. The rest of the book is nothing like chapters 1 and 2. It's a lot like Ezekiel and a lot like Isaiah. He really becomes a prophet. He really starts to show what it is. That he wants the people to know because prophets are those who are sent by God to tell the people this is what is really true. And he gets to the point. So if you would, look, at me, look with me over in chapter 3, starting in verse 16, and see these words. I think this is important for us to see this transition. This is what he says. He says, I trembled inside 
when I heard this. My lips, they quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Doesn't have any more questions. He's solid now. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, even though it gets as worse than it is now and as bad as it possibly can be, yet I, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread on the heights. I mean, just look at that transformation. Habakkuk goes from questioning God, wondering why he would allow such obvious wrong things, to wondering why are you going to wipe us out? You know, are these people going to get the retribution? To go into where he's silently say, he's saying, I will wait in silence because I know you are my God. Regardless of how bad it gets, I'm going to choose to rejoice rather than to be angry and upset and question. That is a huge, huge thing. And what really touches me in all this is that we're able to see a person go from a sense of entitlement. God, you owe me these things, right? I'm a believer. You have been following you forever. Why are you allowing this to happen to one in which I'm going to rejoice regardless? I choose to rejoice. How do you go from entitlement to thankfulness? That's really what I want us to explore this moment, this morning. Thanksgiving is coming up, right? Thanksgiving in a time that's going to be really, really strange because it's not going to look like other Thanksgivings. How do we be thankful in moments like those when things are so different than they have been in the past? From you owe me big time to <laughs> thank you for all that I have. That's, that's, that's really, really where we need to get to. And this, this is a lesson for our times because we as a people should aspire to be thankful because we have so many blessings in our lives, truly. As Americans, we've gotten very, very used to having our desires fulfilled. If they don't get fulfilled, we have a complaint, and we will voice it, and we will get it right, right? That's, that's how we operate. And I will admit, there are struggling sections within our country. There are people who are homeless. There are people who are hungry today. There are people who need things. Every society has that. It's a part of, of being human, is that others are going to struggle, even if you succeed. But if we look at the rest of the world, man, we have so many things to be thankful for. I mean, I, I have spent time as a missionary in India. Oh my gosh, I have no idea how they live. It is so hard, and they don't. Eat, and yet they smile. <laughs> Most amazing thing you've ever seen. You feel like you need so much more than you actually, actually do. We are truly blessed. We simply need to get to a place where we can appreciate. That's really, really what we need. We, we need this lesson of Habakkuk to be very, very contemporary for us. You see, our hearts, they are not something that is satisfied so very easily. Right? We want and we want and we want. And when we get, we go, oh, man, I knew I was going to get that. <laughs> and then we go, ooh, I see something that's even better than what I just got. You see, our hearts are insatiable. They want, and 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 when they get it, they want some more. How do we get past that and say, mm, what I have is enough. It's truly enough. God has blessed me greatly. I need to be thankful for those things. I remember before I got into the Army, man, I was, I was poor. <laughs> I was one of those people. I was really, really struggling. There was, there was some paperwork problems. I had to wait six months later to get in the Army than I thought I was going to get in. And man, it was, it was getting hard to buy diapers. And yet, here I am 14 years in, and I am so entitled. Oh, I hate myself sometimes, right? Because I don't appreciate all those wonderful things that I have now that I didn't have before. I've forgotten so much because that heart of mine, it just keeps wanting more and more and more. There has to be a point at which we say, no, 
thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you so much for what I have. And I want to share with something with you really quick because I've taken a lot of time already. Was something that I have found very, very, very helpful over time. You see, we all have desires, right? We, we have things that we want, and we can identify those things as, man, that is a good desire. I need to follow that. And we can also identify desires as very, very bad things. I need to avoid that. And we get them all the time, every day, over and over and over again. They are there, right? And in order for us to go from a desire over to a decision, I think we have a couple of filters that we use in order to determine what it is that we're actually going to do. And those two things are the way you see the world and the things that are important to you. See, those two things are constantly fighting over, should I let that desire actually work itself into doing what I want, what my heart wants, or should I stop it somewhere along the way and choose something else? And we're constantly going through, what is it that I want? Do I need that? What is, how do I go about getting the things in the right way? And what we're really answering in that process is, who do we become? When somebody hears your name, what do they think? When somebody sees your picture, what do they think? It's a lot of the way in which you make these decisions in your life. Are you a safe person? Are you a dangerous person? A lot of that is determined by how you make these decisions. Now, if you want to change the decisions that you make, you have to either change the way that you see things or the things that you value. And let me tell you, you have come to the conclusions of what is important to you and how you see the world through much, much pain. You have seen things that you do not want to repeat. And you say, no, 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 never, never, never again. I am not going to do that. And we see things that are successful. And we say, wow, that's awesome. I want to do that again. And constantly we're thinking, this is how I see things. Or this is what is important to me. If you want to change your decisions, you change those two things. When someone comes to Christ for the first time, it's so hard for them because their perspectives just got thrown way out, right? I was just a guy living a life to go into, I am loved by God. Oh my goodness, this changes everything, right? So the person who doesn't get this, the person who's never thankful, <laughs> it's the person who is completely, utterly selfish. They have no need for it. They don't think that anyone ever contributed anything to their life. We call them narcissists, right? We say, oh, man, I've, I've, had, I've had to work for a few in the past. They're very, very difficult because you can't, you can't talk them into anything. They, they just believe what they believe, right? And they don't do things wrong. So it's really, really hard. So thankfulness can be extremely different, difficult if all of your values and your perspectives tell you that you did it all, right? <laughs> and no one else can take credit for any of that stuff. But is that true? Is it true that you did it all? That it was just you who did all of those things? I know it is not in my life. I have received a tremendous amount of help in my life. To take me from where I was to where I am today took a lot of great, great people. And it continues. There's still great people in my life who are contributing and allowing me to grow and shape and mold into what it is that God wants me to be. And the thing that prevents me from getting to that place of thankfulness is that I don't take the time to get past this evil heart of mine that tells me that thankfulness is weak and get to that place where I actually live in reality, where the things I have are things that I don't necessarily deserve, and someone help me to get there. In order to be thankful, you really have to get yourself out of the way. I know we do great things. I know we work hard. I know we try. I know there's effort involved. But we didn't get there alone. In fact, can we take ourselves to a place where we are thankful even though we have so much less than the other people around us? What has God done for us that would get us to this place? Well, he's done a lot, right? If we just take the time to sit down and say, you know what? Christ died for me. Christ, he didn't have to come here as a sacrifice for my sins, but he loved me enough to do it. Here's one thing that I can be thankful for today. What about this thing? Is that something to be thankful for? My goodness, the chaos that life would be without it. The understanding, just from a small guy like Habakkuk with three chapters that I can talk about 30 minutes, <laughs> just that one little thing, beautiful, wonderful, priceless. They have God's word available 
and that can be used. God gives himself to us through prayer. He gives us a gateway to know him. Wow. It's, it, it's a unique personal relationship. That is something to be thankful for. And he puts people in our paths that allow us to see things from their perspective that we couldn't come to on our own. Beautiful, beautiful people who love us the way that God loves us. Wonderful, wonderful thing. Ultimately, I don't think there's an excuse for not being thankful. And I think that is something that Habakkuk really showed us, isn't it? He came to that place. And he came to that place because God showed him who he was. And he believed him. Habakkuk doesn't have anything. Everything that he has held dear either is gone or he can see that it's going to be gone very, very soon. He's surrounded by his enemies and his life, from our perspective, pure misery. But it doesn't stop him from loving God, does it? It doesn't stop him from being thankful to the God that he serves. And the difference between Habakkuk and us, he has taken the time to mold his understanding of God through being reminded of who God truly is and who he is. And here's my takeaway from today, okay? If you hear nothing else from me today, I want you to do this, okay? I want you to take the time alone in a place where you can simply sit and think about what you are thankful to God for. It's just a blank piece of paper sitting down going, man, you know, Chapman Light gave me a few things, but here are the things that I'm really, really thankful for. Because your history with God, your unique relationship with him, it is all your own. I'm asking you to do like Moses and David and Elizabeth and, and Mary, the ones that we'll be seeing very soon. I'm asking you to write a song to God. Thank him for all those wonderful, wonderful things that he has done for you. Remind yourself that you are not alone on this planet and that you are loved beyond belief if you just take the time to sit down and do it. And then I want you to take a separate piece of paper or draw yourself a line. I want you to remember those people, those people who have developed you, who have loved you along the way. And you know what? This is not an intellectual exercise. This is not for you to simply say, man, I am thankful. This is great. This is for you to realize the true value of being thankful and to call you to action. Be that loving, wonderful person somebody you know who needs that be a person of action be <laughs> doers of the word and not just hearers because Habakkuk understood that right we don't know a lot of what happened to him after this we just know there was a great transformation I'm sure throughout his life he loved people because people need to know that God is there and he loves them too that was the story of Habakkuk I think that's the story of our lives too because we get to experience it as well. And I hope that over the next couple of weeks, as Thanksgiving gets closer and closer, you will have something to truly be thankful for. And it isn't because things are going great in your life. It's because you took the time to realize who God is, how you fit into his plan, and you thank him for all those things that he is and what he has allowed other people to be in your life. And then go be that for somebody else. That's my message this morning. If you would, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to learn <laughs> and to be reminded of your love, the great love that you offer all of us. Thank you for all that we have and all that we can be. Help us, O oh Lord, in this journey, especially during this time. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And since I am over on time, I will go ahead and give you the benediction so that I can let you go. From 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you for being here this morning.